All right, everyone, we're going to do an Ed puzzle today, a little bit different. We're going to do an Ed puzzle with a uh, test review. This review is due for everyone, okay? Uh, question number one, what does, ha what does half life mean? It's the amount of time for half of the sample of a radioactive element to disappear. After two half lives, what percentage of the original sample would remain? Well, 25%, all right? Because you divide it in half twice. So after one half life, you'd have 50%. Uh, Phosphorus 32 has a half life of 14.3 days. Let us use this to do some calculations. How much of a 44 gram sample would remain after 28.6 days? Okay, several ways to do it. One, we can use this formula, but with something easy like this, 14.3 days, 28.6 days, so it underwent two half-lives. So you would divide 44 grams in half twice. That would go down to 22 and then down to 11 grams. How much of a 58-gram sample would remain after 30 days? Okay, and look, use the formula, all right? So here's the formula. The amount left will be equal to 59 grams times 0.5 to the 30 over 14.3. And we can do that on our calculator. 59 times 0 0.5, y to the x, parentheses, 30 divided by 14.3, close parentheses, equals 13.78 grams. So 13.8 grams. If 3.75 grams of a 60 gram sample remains, how many days have passed? All right. So what we need to do is figure out how many half-lives it took from 60 to 3.75, all right? So first, I'm gonna ask you what the answer is right now, and then I'm gonna show you how to work it. 3.75 times two would be 7.5 times two would be 15, times two would be 30, times two would be 60. So one, two, three, one, two, three, half-lives. One, two, three, four half-lives. So how many days have passed? 14.3 uh, days is a half-life, so four times 14.3 equals Fifty-seven point two. Fifty-seven point two days have passed. <clears throat> All right. If we're looking at smaller elements near the top of the periodic table, about what ratio of neutrons to protons would create a st stable element with a long half-life? That's from your notes. One to one for small. For small elements. If we're looking at larger elements like lead near the bottom of the table about what ratio of neutrons to protons would create a stable element. Also from your notes, three to two. Below show three different particles, all right? An alpha particle is four over two helium plus plus, or you could write alpha plus plus. Uh, a beta negative particle, and here's a beta positive particle show the name in math. Alpha, beta negative, that's an electron, and then beta positive, that's a positron. <clears throat> All right. Carbon-14 normally beta decays. Show an equation explaining the new element it would create. So I'll ask you, what would it create? All right, let's see if you got it right. 14 over 6C, zero over negative one beta, and seven, 14, nitrogen, all right? Stable nitrogen. What element would be produced if carbon-14 alpha decayed? Okay, 
14 over 6C would alpha decay into 4 over 2 helium plus plus. And let's see, 10 over 4 beryllium. So beryllium 10. Show the beta positive decay of zirconium 90. Okay, 90 over 40 ZR beta positive decay. Here's a positron. 90 what plus 1? 39 yttrium. Yttrium 90. Okay. All right. Here we go. List the three particles and what it takes to stop them. Alpha can be stopped by paper. And then beta negative and beta positive, which this is an electron, this is a positron. They can be stopped by aluminum foil or wood. Okay. The most dangerous thing that occurs during radiation is the emitting of blank gamma rays, which can only be stopped by thick concrete or the element lead. Who is the female scientist who is credited with huge leaps in the understanding of radioactivity? Well, one, there's Lise Meitner. But that's, that's not who I was asking about. The one we studied the most was Marie Curie, Madame Curie. All right, the last problems here, this last set, this next set, excuse me, is on Le Chatelier's principle. First, we've got to balance this bad boy, which I believe is going to give us 1, 3, 1, 1. And in this equation, I'm showing it to be exothermic. All right. Is it exothermic or endothermic? It's exothermic. All right. Adding sulfur dioxide would create a shift to the blank, and the K would blank. We add some more of this, I have a shift to the right. Oh, I need to draw the arrow both ways here. Sorry, I couldn't do that with my uh, computer program. And the K would not change. K would not change at all. All right? Adding oxygen will create a shift to the left, and the K would not change. Removing sulfur dioxide, whoop, we pull some of this out. We're going to have to shift to the left and make more of that, and the K would not change. Adding pressure would create a shift to the, okay. Adding pressure means that you have less gases. So it's going to be a shift to the right, because see there's only one, two gas bubbles over here, and there's one, two, three, four gas bubbles over there. And the K would not change. Adding heat. All right, this is exothermic. Adding heat would create a shift to the left. This thing needs to be able to give off heat. It's like your car engine. If you put it in a hot place, it can't run very well. And the K would go down, okay? Now, a shift to the left means the K goes down. A shift to the right means the K goes up. Adding fluorine gas would create a shift to the right, and the K would not change. Now, you're like, Mr. Perkins, you just said the K would change. The only thing that changes the K, people, is heat and temperature. Removing heat would create a shift. This is exothermic. So if we removed heat, it would be able to go better. Shift to the right, and the K would go up. K would go up. An equation with a K higher than 1 favors the products. That's why I'm saying if we go to the right and make more products, the K goes up. Why would the results and shifts only occur when changing the numbers of gases and not solids. The solids and, and also water, water doesn't change anything. They don't have enough surface area. We mentioned this several times. 
who, who is or was, who was Fritz Haber, and what did he do that was helpful to humanity? Also, he was a jerk, don't forget. He um, figured out how to get fertilizer from the air. But remember, he figured that out while trying to murder people, so that's a bummer. Write the KEQ for the Haber-Bosch process. So here it is. If you're going to write the K for this equation, you put the products on top raised to the power of their molarity. So NH3, and there's a 2 there, so to the second, over N2, and that would just be the first, so you don't have to write everything, anything, times H2 to the third. Peace out. I hope you enjoyed this 11 or so minute Ed Puzzle review.